follow the service on page 167. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those who are most need of thy mercy. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Thy will be undone, and thy will be undone and done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the responsive reading of the intro, as it's printed in your bulletin. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him. And show him my salvation. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up. You will tread on the lion and the adder. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him. And show him my salvation. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. During Lent, we omit the hymn of praise, and we continue with the salutation on page 172. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, you led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Genesis in the 22nd chapter. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, 
your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading comes from James in the first chapter. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. 
Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the gospel of our Lord. and peace be to you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our text today is from the Gospel reading, verses 12 and 13. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. There ends our text. Fellow redeemed, Mark's Gospel account of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness is different than Matthew and Luke's account of it. Both Matthew and Luke give us details about Jesus' encounter with the devil in the wilderness and how he was tempted. They record how the devil came against Jesus and tempted him with food, with fame, and with riches. But Mark's gospel doesn't say a word about what kind of temptations Jesus faced. He only tells us that Jesus was driven into the wilderness and was there for 40 days. Mark's focus is primarily on the place where Jesus went, the wilderness. He mentions it twice, in fact, so we catch what he's talking about. 
perhaps this focus on the place is because the wilderness was a very special place as far as the Jews were concerned. This was the place where Israel wandered for 40 years after they left Egypt and before they came into the promised land. And during those 40 years, Israel was tempted by the devil. They were tempted in lots of different ways. They were tempted by lack of food and water. They were tempted by the false gods of the other tribes living out there in the wilderness. They were tempted by their own aches and pains, their lack of a place to stay, a lack of home. See, it was one thing after another. And at all of those different temptations, Israel failed God miserably. They complained and they sinned against him constantly throughout those 40 years of wandering. Jesus is sent into the wilderness by the Spirit for 40 days. Those 40 days mirror the 40 years of Israel. It's not a coincidence. Jesus is essentially becoming Israel before God. He is reenacting Israel's wandering in the wilderness, but this time, Jesus does it without sin. He gets tempted by the devil like Israel did, but he doesn't sin and complain against God. Jesus was making right what Israel got wrong. And there's something else about that wilderness that was especially important to Israel. There was a ritual that God commanded to be done in Israel, a ritual dating back all the way to the days of Moses and Aaron, the high priest. This ritual involved two goats that were supposed to be brought to Aaron, the high priest. One of those goats was made the sacrifice of atonement. Its blood was spilled to atone for the sins of the people. It was a symbol of Christ and the spilling of the blood of the Son of God for the sins of the people. But that other goat, that was a symbol of Christ too, but in a very different way. The second goat was a scapegoat. This is how the book of Leviticus describes what happened to the scapegoat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions, concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and he shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. Jesus, who is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness, is becoming the scapegoat for Israel. All the sins of God's people were placed upon him, and not just Israel's sins the sins of the whole world. And he bore those sins away into an uninhabited land to take them completely away from the people and make them his own. So Jesus is the scapegoat. This entire episode of Jesus in the wilderness is all about Jesus becoming the substitute for God's people the righteous for the unrighteous, the pure for the sinful. God is substituting himself for us by physically taking all of our sins onto himself and taking them away and by making right what we get wrong. But the question for us today is what are we supposed to do with that? I mean, this is nice and all that Jesus substitutes himself for us. But how does that change anything for me today? How does that resolve the fight that I had with my spouse or with my kids? How's that going to help me find a job? How's that going to get rid of my anxiety problem? Or make my parents understand me better? See, we are a people that want practical answers for our real problems. So how is this business of Jesus acting as a substitute for me in the wilderness going to answer any of my real-life problems? Well, it's not. 
Jesus taking your sins away so that you're not judged for them doesn't mean that he's going to fix your financial problems or resolve all your relationship issues or solve all your medical woes. What it does mean, though, is that Jesus is going to fix you. He's going to change how God sees you. He's going to change how you see yourself and how you see yourself in relationship to all those other problems you think are so big. What Jesus' substitution means for us is that that whole mountain of problems we think we see really aren't nearly as bad as we think they are. Because in Christ, they are carried for us. You are free from having to find your peace and wholeness in this world, in the things of this world. You have ultimate peace with God and His forgiveness because you have a Savior who has substituted Himself for you. See, what this substitution business means for us, practically speaking, is that there is not a pain we have in this world that can take us away from God. Because Christ has carried the whole of who we truly are away from us and crucified it in his own flesh. Our problems don't define us. Christ defines us. Now, I mentioned this the other day at Ash Wednesday, but it's worth mentioning again. I assume... By now, you've all heard of the 21 Christians who were murdered in Libya by ISIS. The video of their murder was actually online. And what it shows right before they die is that they're whispering. And what they're whispering is the words, O oh Lord Jesus Christ. They died literally with Jesus on their lips. Each one of those 21 men was given an option. They were all given the opportunity to renounce Christ and go on and live normal, long lives or die and hold to Christ. Every one of them chose death rather than renouncing Christ. Now, what did Jesus' substitution mean for them as they knelt there in the sand with a knife on the back of their necks? It meant everything to them. It meant they had a life that couldn't be snuffed out by death. It meant they had the love of God in the very moment when the world was spilling out its most vile evil on them. As it turns out, two of these 21 people that were murdered were brothers. Their third brother was still in Egypt. And he posted an online message to the murderers. He thanked them for showing the video of his brothers being killed because he saw Jesus on their lips as they were being killed. And he said it helped strengthen his faith in a way that nothing else had. And there was also a message online from the mother of those two boys. The message she gave to those murderers was this. She said she was going to be praying for them, that God turned them away from the lies that were so binding them to such hatred, and that God bring them into the love and grace of Christ so that they could know the same grace and salvation that her sons knew. The prayer of Jesus for the soldiers who were nailing him to the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. That prayer was essentially the same prayer on the lips of the brother of those men and on the mother of those men. This is where Jesus as substitute means everything. It was Jesus that gave the families of these martyrs the ability to forgive and to pray for their enemies. 
It was Jesus who gave strength and trust in God to those men as they were murdered. And every one of them was in their 20s. And it was Jesus who reached out to those Islamic murderers through the example of faith in those men and who even now calls to those Islamic murderers in the name of Christ and begs them, begs them to come to him for forgiveness and eternal life. Where death and damnation meet this world, that's where Jesus' substitution for us means everything. And that's also where everything else we think is so important and all-consuming in this life means nothing. The challenge of this Christian faith of ours, the really hard part of being a Christian, is to live each and every day knowing that death and damnation are right there at our shoulder, trying to claim us, trying to shake the love of Christ out of us, trying to crowd Jesus out of our lives with a thousand other concerns we think we have. Jesus, as our substitute, means everything for us. It defines us against the death and damnation that seek to claim us. We will never live trouble-free lives in this world, and Jesus never promised that we would. But we can now go through each and every day mindful that that death and damnation that seeks our ruin has its answer in the peace and the grace of our Savior who substituted his life for ours. We can live above all the problems that consume the rest of the world. When Christ is on our lips, when his forgiving grace is put within us in his word and his sacrament, we can meet the death and damnation loose in this world with faith, with the love of Christ and the strength of the Almighty God knowing that even a whole host of hell that comes against us cannot take away the gifts of love and eternal life that our Savior has given to us. So may God grant us that strength through our Savior's substitution for us. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess together our saving faith with the words of the Nicene Creed on page 174. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, Maker of heaven. pray. Heavenly Father, the world by its many sins has kindled the fires of your wrath, and no person, be he ever so perfect, can rob death of its sting, nor hell of its terror. Though we are by nature children of wrath, you have loved us with such a great love that you did not spare your own Son, 
but gave him up as a substitute for us all. You sent him here to do for us what we cannot of ourselves do. He became the ransom for our sins. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for having so redeemed us by your sins and by your Son and having rescued us from our sins. Lord God, you bind up and you heal. We pray this day that you grant the blessing of your healing love to Arvind Doring as he faces surgery this week. Bless the hands of the doctors and grant them success. Fill our veen with trust in you and with a certain knowledge of your unfailing mercy. No Holy Spirit, light divine, we pray as well that you enter our hearts with your many blessings and that you live there within us. Take away any trust we may have in our own righteousness and lead us always to make sincere confession of our sins. Fill us with steadfast faith that we might constantly trust all that Jesus has done for our salvation. And when he comes to judge this world, may he count us as God's children and heirs of eternal life. Help us to live, we pray, in this true faith, to confess the holy name of Jesus, to abide by his word, and to follow wherever he leads. All this we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.
with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and to be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Peace of the Lord be with you always.
this true body and precious blood of our Lord and Savior, strengthen and preserve you steadfast. <laughs>
Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.